Thank you, sir. Real, welcome. Uh, really happy you guys all could be here. Today's talk is about exploratory data analysis and visualization for image segmentation challenge. But before I dive into the talk, like just a slight mandatory uh, yeah, information about me. I'm Ekhtiar Said. I'm working here as an ML engineer uh, in ASML. And uh, day in, day out, I basically work with scaling and productizing machine learning models. So that's my main job. Also on the side, I work in uh, as uh, faculty in Tilburg University. So we have a data science uh, department in Den Bosch and I'm sitting there four hours a week. Uh, before I was also in this region in Eindhoven uh, working with uh, Philips Lighting. Now it's known as Signify. Um, on the side I'm really passionate about spreading um, knowledge of data science to the community at large. So PyData is one of the uh, initiatives I'm quite uh, passionately involved with and also on the side I do a bit of um, weekend caggling. So this talk is more about that part. It's not really anything to do with work. Um, and also on the side, we have uh, started with a small um, organization called OpenDSC. And through this, we try to contribute more educational content on GitHub. Like I have code repositories that teach Spark and then my colleagues from the same organization contributes to um, teaching free machine learning courses. Okay, that's enough about me. Uh, today's talk is about image segmentation. First, I'm just going to cover like uh, typical uh, challenges that you can do with images, right? So you have first classification, right? Where you just want to say that, yeah, this uh, has a certain um, element or it doesn't. Then you have uh, object detection where you are giving coordinates like, okay, yeah, we have hot air balloon here and this is where the balloons are. Um, Semantic segmentation, right? That's basically uh, what we're going to go into now. Um, and this is where we give the layer, or so we are basically predicting for every pixel whether the content exists or not, right? So for this um, um, hot air balloons, we say, okay, these are the pixels which actually has hot air balloons. <laughs> go Kuni. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, and then there's instance segmentation where we are doing the pixel labeling as well as um, each instance of it. So we are able to say, okay, we have uh, one hot air balloon, two hot air balloons, just like this. And today we are going to look into this semantic. So image segmentation, um, in terms of data formats, for those who are not really familiar with working with images, of course we have like the image data, and then we have uh, the labels, right? Like your, uh, train, the stuff you train with. So that image data uh, and the label is also known as mask because it's kind of overlays on top of the image like a mask and typically in these challenges you would be designing and developing a machine learning model CNNs uh, to uh, have an output like the one on the right like mask right so we feed the models in the end when it's working very well the image data and uh, we expect the mask as the output after the model has been trained but we're not going to go into the modeling today. It's about doing the basic right, right? Fundamental, fundamental, fundamental. So before we go to the modeling, it's really important to understand what kind of data you have. And typically, with uh, images, since you don't have um, yeah, a lot of other data, like it's not highly, highly, highly dimensional, like it doesn't have a lot of variables and stuff, so you just feed it into the model. And um, I'm going to show you all the stuff that you can do with image data to do EDAs. So, like I said, that's the content of today. Um, it's about Kaggle, and if you are not on Kaggle yet, it should be there. Kaggle is where we should be spending our weekends, guys. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I've participated in three um, competitions on Kaggle, and for those three competitions, I also did three EDAs. And those three EDAs also got gold medals, and I'm basing the talk on those three EDAs um, today. And I'm not going to go through the full notebook. I'm just going to take some highlights and talk about that. But you can find this slide later on and also those notebooks and you can see the full detail of it. And I've also simplified the visualizations a lot because it doesn't make sense for uh, PowerPoint. The first challenge is pneumothorax, which is um, when you have buildup of gas in your lungs. So in this competition, it's really about helping patients when they have uh, all of a sudden a collapsed lungs. 
And typically, you don't even go to the medical center apparently to get this checked up. It's something that just comes up because they're doing a chest x-ray for some other reason. And uh, radiologists are uh, quite often ignoring them because they're not really trained to look into air. They're more interested in your bones and et cetera. So this competition was about training uh, ML model so you can do segmentation of the area where gas might have been built up on the lungs. So there's about 12K data. And a uh, nice thing about this competition was that there was also metadata available. So that's quite rare for image segmentation challenges, right? And here's a link to my kernel. Um, and it, you'd see it's quite difficult to see pneumothorax. Like, it's not, it's, this is actually one of the easiest one, where pneumothorax, there is a buildup. And if I press the next one, that's basically the region where it's happening. And if I overlay the mask on top of it, that's exactly where the gas built up is, right? And if you're not going in for this checkup, it's quite normal for the uh, radiologist to ignore it. So AI should be able to help out for this case. And here in this one, um, as always, there is a huge class imbalance. So you, don't, you have like a lot of no pneumothorax example, um, but like not enough of the positive cases. Um, also, another thing to mention is that it may happen that you have gas buildup in multiple regions. So I quickly did like a plot to see, okay, um, typically how many uh, regions you see develop. So this is, of course, the first thing we do when we go into a competition, see how much, uh, what's like your distribution of data, and if you have more than one segmentation uh, per image. Furthermore, here in this case, you have like the age and gender. So one obvious thing to do was to like really see, okay, if there is a difference between age, uh, for example, uh, for the patients, and then also for the gender, right? So, um, yeah, should I make it stop? <laughs> Just being more interactive. Okay, so uh, <laughs> nobody had a problem when it was spinning. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, there is a nice box plot, and you do see like, hey, uh, for really like for pneumothorax, people with pneumothorax, your min and max is pretty high, so some hint of data leakage there. Uh, for Kaggle, it's fine, but real life, yeah, leakage doesn't help. So, no, there's not really much in terms of age and in terms of gender, right? But it's good to know that we have some metadata and we can further go on uh, to our investigation. So, um, another nice thing here is that in the metadata, uh, they have this um, uh, field called pixel spacing. So because it's in this uh, highly standardized uh, medical image capturing format, they have this concept of actually giving you like the physical space in patient's chest and what it means on the pixel to pixel distance. So it's sort of like this. Uh, you have like the column spacing and row spacing. And um, in that part, you would know like, okay, what is approximately the area. And we have also the mask, right? So if you actually count the non-zero elements of the mask, you can sort of estimate what is the size of the buildup. And that's also a nice thing to do in this uh, particular challenge. So that's exactly what I did. I uh, went on to measure the size of the buildup of the gas for uh, different um, age groups, for example. And with that, I plotted this out. And um, what I did here was I took the age and I just categorized it into four different groups, like child, youth, a, uh, adult, and senior, and um, then did the box plot of the area. Sorry, I really couldn't scale, so you see like the scale for, I mean, they're not really uh, yeah, scaled in the same way, but anyway, more for me to learn on Plotly. Um, yeah, there is definitely quite a strong relation with uh, the size of the lungs, of course, and the area, uh, area where you're going to have a buildup. So, childs typically have to have a smaller region, uh, per se. And uh, what was interesting, though, is like uh, uh, youth, like the uh, group youth, they had a uh, higher um, yeah, median and Q3 as well than adults. So, I don't, I'm not a radiologist, I can't really work and, but, or interpret these, but these are just my findings. So. Um, yeah, we do see that there are some unique characteristics per groups and gender in terms of also outlier and so on. Um, I wanted to find out a little bit more. So this particular uh, image, if you notice, there is like full chest, but our point of interest is just the lungs. And there are pre-trained models. So there was competitions before where we did have pre-trained models to do lung segmentation. So if we can take out just the lung 
I have more insights. So that's what I tried to do using a pre-trained model to do image segmentation and just take out uh, the rest of it. Um, for training, it's not a good idea, of course, because you want the noise to be there, but this is just for insights. So there was a particular uh, pre-trained model that I tried to use. Um, here, you see it works quite okay for a male um, patient, but actually when I uh, tried it for my uh, female patient data set, it was not really working so well. Because probably like also you have like, a, uh, yeah, like the breast formation and that maybe causes the module to get confused. But that's also interesting. Maybe like, you know, this also starts giving, or at least it started giving me a hint on how I should train my data and if I should have separate models in uh, terms of different groups um, and then uh, do that. Because that's also in the data like age and sex. So I can feed it to two different networks if I wanted to. Okay, so then the second challenge, I'm really good with time. Okay, second challenge is about steel defect detection. So this particular challenge is about detecting different type of defects, uh, defects on steel. And of course, uh, more modern society would not really be possible without steel. And our um, aim here is to make this production process more efficient. And here you have actually some multi cause problems. So you have like four type of defects that's uh, the four type right over there. And um, there is about 12, 12 and a half K images. And yeah, they're sort of high resolution, sort of. Um, and this is basically my kernel link. So first off, like as always, I'm just going to check with like the different uh, classes and like how well they're represented. And you see like, yeah, type three is like way, 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 way high uh, represented and then the rest is not so well represented. And uh, furthermore, there is also a lot of images without any defects, which is fine for a lot of use cases. But here, actually, the defect doesn't really occur in the whole image. It's quite a small space. So the network itself already has enough information or noise in the image uh, where there is defect to understand also what is not a defect. So these, uh, in the end, actually, I didn't really need to use the information um, about where the, yeah, there are no defects. Because no defects is also included in images with defects, right? There are regions, which is fine. So here, for example, we don't have any metadata. And if you were to do any further ID, you'd just be like, okay, I'm done. Let's just start doing modeling. But that's um, often, like, from my experience, is not a good idea. And remember, you still have the mask. So when you are in trouble, like you are in a plane, the pressure drops, use your mask. And um, here, what I did, because there are, like all the images, all the, all the images are sort of scaled in the same way, you can count like the number of pixels you have per mask and get an approximation of the uh, surface area, right? It's a proxy figure, per se. So it would allow you to better understand the class. Because just because I have 10,000 examples of a particular class doesn't mean that I have a lot of real estate in the image of that class, right? Maybe they're really tiny, and the network will have difficult time finding out about these. And that's what I did. Um, so I started, um, well, well this, this plot here on the left, this basically is just like your pie plot uh, showing like, okay, uh, per class, what, uh, what is its contribution? And then on the other side, I just took like, uh, the area for the defects from the mask. And what you see is interesting is like for class one, you have like 12.6% of like the whole data set. So it seems like, okay, it's not bad representation. Like you would think like only um, class um, two is like the one that's really struggling. But you really see on the right, like, yeah, actually you have maybe a lot of examples, but in terms of the total area, those are really, really small examples. So you need to pay really attention, or your network needs to pay more attention to those uh, area, right? And in terms of class four, you see that, yeah, it's about 11.3%, but it goes up. So these areas maybe are bigger, right? So maybe these are really big errors. So we can even do one level better. And what can we do here is really simple. You have multiple defect segment, right? 
and we can we and we should basically count these segments but this is not given in the data set like the data set is just one layer of mask but you can write a simple uh, function using OpenCV to basically understand the threshold, right? Because mask is just usually binary, and in this case it is binary. So you can just understand the threshold and count the contours and then understand, okay, for this defect, for this image, I have eight spots, right? So now you have another variable to work with. So that's what I did. And if I um, basically take the average segment per defect and plot it out, and then also like uh, the average size, so there is just a pixel count, just a proxy figure uh, per defect. What we notice is quite interesting. We see that like for type one and type um, for type two, the number of average is quite low. So basically type two typically comes in just one or two small pieces and type one are like scattered many small spots. In terms of area, both of them are really small, right? So that's interesting. And for type four, we see that the areas for each segment even, they're large. So these are actually really chunks, big chunk of error. Um, and you can of course go all level deeper and maybe just group them out. So if you say that, okay, the number of segments five to 10 is in one bucket, 10 plus is one bucket, uh, you see actually further my point. Like type two is really um, tend to come like in a really tiny small spot and um, rest of the stuff are somewhat similar, but remember they're not really underrepresented except for type three. So this actually was quite handy for me to do before I went into the main competition. And if I summarize everything up, um, type one, it tends to be small in size and typically comes in like many small segments, right? Like, so these are just like two examples. Uh, one of them I just put there like, yeah, it can happen that it's just one uh, instance. And then on the bottom you see there are like three instances. Um, type two, it tends to typically come um, also in like small size, but not in large numbers, just in small numbers. Um, and then type three, we see here like over there, yeah, and you see like, yeah, that can come either like in um, three or five or 10 and 15, but then the area, surface area is a bit larger. But then when I actually physically look into the images, like you see sometimes it's large because the errors are very near each other, but we're not gonna go into that much detail now, but yeah. Uh, but in terms of surface area for the network to work with, there's a lot for type three and uh, interestingly enough, also for type four. So type four, uh, even though it's not a huge image sample, you have a lot of real estate to work with here. So when I first did like the uh, model to like do the segmentation, type one and type two, and also like the open source one I committed, you'll see there, it's really difficult for you to find unless you come up with a better strategy for training, right? Like you can, let's say, do image augmentation and then uh, upsample type one and type two. But straight off the box, I tried, I believe, like uh, resu uh, yeah, ResUnit. And for that, type three and type four did not need any fine tuning. And type four is actually not that many. Okay. And final competition, and then we're done. So the final one is about understanding clouds, like not like Google Cloud or Amazon, really the cloud. And um, from here, we uh, are asked to basically ca classify the type of cloud formation for meteorologists. Of course, climate change is one of the most pressing issues of our time. And this competition is supposed to help people, um, like professionals, understand why these clouds are forming in an automated way, and then better understand like how we are changing the climate. Um, so. Uh, that reminds me the goodie bags you received today are fully sustainable and decomposable and so don't <laughs> we are trying to do our part here. Okay, um, and yeah, the images are quite, uh, um, quite like high resolution and there is not that many of them, right? So there is like about 5.5K images and uh, here is my EDA find me in the clouds. So um, as always, check out the number of labels you have and you have, uh, yeah, what kind of defects you have per um, image. So these are the four types of cloud formation. They call them sugar, gravel, fish, flower. And um, for once, it's not imbalanced. So it's nice competition. Um, 
if you see the number of cloud formations you typically tend to find in a single image, it's actually more than one typically, right? So that's the ni that's an interesting thing already. Like yeah, these formations, of course, in an image, it's a pretty big image, so you would find two to three per image. So it's good for you to understand that and know that, so you don't all uh, just start chopping up the image and feeding the full blown image to the network. Um, yeah, network needs to have more context in that case, right? And in cases like this where you have multi class and you have a um, uh, nice balance in between the classes, one thing you can do is do frequent pattern. And I think everybody almost here knows about frequent pattern, but just, to, uh, just for books keeping sake, I made some few uh, statements about what it is. So it's basically like about like your simple association rule, right? Like um, you just want to see which items occur very frequently in an item set. So if a restaurant was just selling like beer, pizza, and other food, um, like these icons are showing here. So all the transactions, right, we, if you denote them as T, and the event, like peop order, people or at least order drinks and pizza, I put that as X, you would have a support of like count of X divided by count of T, and you use support as like sort of like a threshold to move away the stuff you don't care about and keep the patterns that you like. So, um, using frequent pattern mining, what I did was I went through the data set and see which cloud formations occur very frequently. And there are clearly some patterns. So some cloud formations definitely happen more frequently than others. And then there are some that occur less than others. Uh, but the main, most important thing is almost all kind of um, cloud formation can appear together in the image, just some are more likely than others, right? So. That's also important in your training or how you design the architecture or how you resize the image. That, okay. So we are at the end of the talk and I think I do the uh, PyData event a favor if I can finish a little bit early. Hope I wasn't going too fast. Uh, to summarize, basically. Uh, we have metadata and if you are lucky enough to have metadata, use it and you can also combine it with um, the mask to make even more, more, more plots. If you're not lucky to have metadata, you always have your mask. So use it to calculate the area, see how many segments you have, this sort of thing. Um, if you have a pre-trained model to do additional segmentation onto a point of interest instead of the whole thing, that may be able to help you, but not often is uh, useful because, uh, you know, all models are a little bit biased, right? So for your image set, maybe the pre-trained model doesn't work so well. Um, and finally, if you have uh, in ba I mean, balanced class and there are multiple classes, you can use frequent pattern mining and that should be able to produce uh, some additional insight. So that is basically uh, my talk for today. Just one last slide. Thank you for coming to PyData Eindhoven. It's like really, it's really special for me uh, to be able to do this uh, for the first time. Uh, my, I'm not born here like a lot of people, but I, um, my professional career mostly revolves around here. So I'm really, really happy that uh, so many people turned up um, and we were able to do this. And a big thanks to ASML as well for uh, enabling uh, this. Um, yeah, so final, final slide. These are my profiles. So if you want to connect, please reach out to me via LinkedIn or Kaggle. There are some courses I made on GitHub. And yeah, that's it for today. Thank you.